on July 30, 1975. Hova was at a restaurant in Blumenfeld Township. At 2.15, Hova called his wife Josephine from a payphone to complain that he was being stood up at a lunch meeting with two mobsters, adding he would return home by 4 p.m. to grill steaks for dinner. Hova never made it back for dinner, and the following morning, his green Pontiac Grandville was found ill in the Matches Red Fox parking lot. With the filling of a missing person report that evening, the case was formally opened on what would become one of the country's most famous mysteries. A mystery that has inspired books, TV shows, movies, the most recent is Martin Scorsese's Oscars nominated film, The Irishman, and a raft of conspiracy theories. In this episode, we will shed light on Jimmy Hoffa's mysterious disappearance and provide you with all that you need to know about who he was, his disappearance and new revelations in his case. Before we start, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell button to receive our latest notifications. Before talking about Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance, it is crucial to look back at his early life, how he became the Teamsters president and what did he stand for. With all of this combined, you will have a better understanding of Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance case. James Riddle Hoffa was born on February 14, 1913 in Brazil, Indiana, United States. His father was an Indiana coal miner who died of lung cancer in 1920, when Hoffa was just 7 years old. His mother was of Irish ancestry. The family moved to Detroit in 1924, where Hoffa was raised and lived the rest of his life. He dropped out of school when he was still 14 years old and began working full-time manual labor jobs to help support his family. He worked as a stock boy and warehouse man for several years. In Bowling Green, Ohio on September 24, 1936, Hova married Josephine Podziwak an 18-year-old Detroit laundry worker of Polish heritage. The couple had met six months earlier during a non-unionized laundry worker strike action. They had two children, a daughter, Barbara Ann Kranzer, and a son, James P. Hoffa. The Hovas paid $6,800 in 1939 for a modest home in northwestern Detroit. The family later owned a simple summer lakefront cottage in Orient Township, Michigan, north of Detroit. Jimmy Hoffa proved a natural leader in his youth. Before becoming a family man, at the age of 20, he helped organize a labor strike in Detroit and remained an advocate for downtrodden workers for the rest of his life. Hoffa began union organizational work at the grassroots level through his job as a teenager with a grocery chain, which paid substandard wages and offered poor working conditions with minimal job security. The workers were displeased with that situation and tried to organize a union to better their lot. Although Hova was young, his courage and approachability in that role impressed fellow workers, and he rose to a leadership position. By 1932, after refusing to work for an abusive shift foreman, Hova left the grocery chain, partly because of his union activities. He was then invited to become an organizer with Local 299 of the Teamsters in Detroit. Hova's charisma and talent as a local organizer quickly got him noticed by the Teamsters and carried him upward through its ranks. Then a small but rapidly growing union, the Teamsters organized truckers across the country and through the use of strikes, boycotts and some more powerful though less legal methods of protest, won contract demands on behalf of workers. The Teamsters founded in 1903 had 75,000 members in 1933 as a result of Hova's work with other union leaders to consolidate local union trucker groups into regional sections and then into a national body, which Hova ultimately completed over two decades. Membership grew to 170,000 members by 1936, and three years later there were 420,000 members. The number grew steadily during World War II and in the post-war boom to top a million member by 1951. Hoffa worked to defend the Teamsters from raids by other unions, including Congress of Industrial Organizations, and he extended the Teamsters' influence in the Midwest from the late 1930s to the late 1940s. Although he never actually worked as a truck driver, 
He became president of Local 299 in December 1946. He then rose to lead the combined group of Detroit area locals shortly afterwards, and later advanced to become head of the Michigan Teamsters group. Meanwhile, Hoffa obtained a deferment from military service in World War II by successfully making a case for his union leadership skills being of more value to the nation by keeping freight running smoothly to assist the war effort. In 1952, Hoffa was selected as national vice president by incoming president Dave Beck, the successor of Daniel G. Tobin. Hoffa had quelled an internal revolt against Tobin by securing central state regional support for Beck at the convention. In exchange, Beck made Hoffa a vice president. The IBT moved its headquarters from Indianapolis to Washington, D.C., taking over a large office building in the capital in 1955. Hoffa became president of the Teamsters in 1957, when its former leader was imprisoned for bribery. As chief, Hoffa was lauded for his tireless work to expand the union, and for his unflagging devotion to even the organization's least powerful members. His caring and approachability were captured in one of the most well-known quotes attributed to him. You got a problem? Call me. Just pick up the phone. Hoffa was wildly popular during his presidency time, and that's due to his dedication to the worker and his electrifying public speeches. He was known among his fellow workers and the politicians and businessmen with whom he negotiated. Hoffa fought and won many battles on behalf of America's drivers' union. But that doesn't mean he didn't have a dark side. In Hoffa's time, many Teamsters leaders cooperated with the Mafia in racketeering, extortion and embezzlement. Hoffa himself had relationships with mobsters' leaders and was the target of several government investigations throughout the 1960s. In 1967, he was convicted of bribery, jury tampering, fraud and conspiracy and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Hoffa refused to resign as president of the Teamsters while in prison and kept his position until 1971. He passed his Teamsters presidency to Frank Fitzsimmons and received a presidential pardon from Richard Nixon in 1971. With the stipulation, he was to steer clear of union activity until 1980. However, Hova had no intention of waiting that long, and he was exploring ways to regain his leadership. Hova had a meeting with Tony Jack Giacalone and Tony Provenzano, high-ranking members of the Detroit and New York mobs. Respectively, Hova wanted to smooth over the relationship with a meeting at Machos Red Fox, a restaurant in Blumenfeld Township. On July 30, 1975, Hova called his wife Josephine from a payphone to say that he'd been stood up at the lunch meeting with the two mobsters. And that was the very last time he was heard from. His family filed a missing person report to the Blumenfeld Township Police the next day. Hova's wife called her son and daughter to say that their father had not come home. On her way home, Hova's daughter claimed to have had a vision of her father, who she was already sure was dead. He was slumped over and wore a dark-colored short-sleeved polo shirt. It has mystified her ever since that, although she could not have possibly known that prior to her arrival at Lake Orion. The clothing in her vision was exactly what Hova was wearing when he disappeared. At 7.20 am, Lento went to the mattress Red Fox and found Hova's unlocked car in the parking lot but there was no sign of Hova nor any indication of what had happened to him. The search for Hova involved local police, 200 FBI agents and a series of federal grand juries. When police started to investigate Hova's disappearance, they found his car at the restaurant where he reportedly had a lunch planned with Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano of New Jersey and Anthony Tony Jack Giacalone. Within days of Hova's disappearance, Dozens of theories surfaced as to who was in the car that picked up Hova and drove him into Act 2, where he was murdered. And there were just as many theories as to the location of the scene of the crime and who actually executed the killing. It is believed by historians that Mafia members wanted to continue working with Fitz. The theory continues on to say that Hova had too much information on the Mafia and its involvement with the Teamsters, and they wanted him dead so he couldn't reveal what he knew. There are several locations in Metro Detroit that people believe could be tied to Hova's disappearance. A few include a North Crocktown location where Hova had the Teamster 299 site, which is where he began his rise to power in the 1930s. There is also a field in Waterford Township 
that was searched two months after Hova's disappearance, but nothing was found. In 2004, police took forensic evidence from his home in Auckland County, where blood was found on the floorboards, but couldn't be matched to Hova's. In a bit of irony, if the mob did call for Hova's death, it is possibly the move also led to the downfall of organized crime. As the investigation was conducted, the governments became more aware of the mob's connections within unions. This sums it up and brings us to the end of today's episode. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel and hit that bell to receive our latest notifications. See you in the next one, take care.